Rock. And I get excited when I hear that song. For one thing, I love that slide guitar playing. But the message of that song is just awesome. I was sitting in a church when a guy walked in and said hi to me. He then walked up to the tower of the church and hit his face against a large bell a few times. Bong, bong, bong. Then he walked back downstairs and said, see you later, mate, and he walked out. As he left, a few fellow church members said to me, do you, do you know that guy? I replied, I don't think so, but his face rings a bell. <laughs> We don't have a belfry here. <laughs> Pastor is looking forward to dinner with the family in his congregation after church on Sunday. The pastor approaches the family and confirms the dinner uh, for the coming Friday. After making small talk for a few minutes, Pastor turned to the couple's five-year-old. He says, have your parents told you what they'll be making for us on Friday? The child thinks, a second replies, goat. The pastor squinted and exclaimed, goat? As the parents are speaking up to clarify, the child cuts in boldly. He says, yeah, yesterday I heard mommy, and dad, mommy tell daddy that Friday is as good a day as any to have the old goat for dinner. <laughs> So you're going to have some scrumptious old goat on Friday. <laughs> this sermon is a little bit of a sort of a continuation of last week's, and it's kind of a hybrid between something I preached uh, four or five years ago. And you're familiar with this verse, Second Chronicles 7, 14. And this is an, a needed verse to, for today as it ever was. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Would you bow your heads, dear Lord, as we enter into this sermon portion of the service today, we thank you, Lord for the word and the power that's in the word that you have given through your Holy Spirit to these words, Lord. They're not just ink on paper, but they are powerful messages in your words, Lord. So we just pray that you will anoint this word as it goes forth and bless it to us today in Jesus, in Jesus' name. Amen. Some call this a Christian nation. I wonder if a nation can be a Christian nation we will one day have a Christian world Amen. we will all the enemies of Christ will be destroyed and he will reign unopposed for a thousand years it can be asserted most definitely that this nation was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. Some scholars like to, to claim that the founding fathers were deists. A deist is one who acknowledges that God exists, but that he has no interest in human affairs. So, but did the founders identify themselves as Christians, did they? Some scholars claim that they did not. In 1776, every European American, with the exception of, uh, of 2,500 approximately Jews, identified himself or herself as a Christian. Everyone, except for the Jewish people, identified as a Christian. Moreover, approximately 98% of the colonists were Protestants, with the remaining 1.9% being Roman Catholic. According to Dr. Robert Jeffries, you know who that is? Robert Jeffries, television guy. He has a big church, I think, in Dallas. He says, in fact, 52 out of the 55 signers of the Constitution, the framers of the Constitution, were evangelical believers. In other words, they had a heart after God like we do. 52 out of 55. 
the very same men went on to form organizations like the American Bible Society, the American Tract Society, and the Philadelphia Bible Society. They were hardly neutral toward the Christian faith. Every state had their own articles of qualification for what it would take to hold office in that state and what it would take to qualify to go to constitutional convention. Article 22 of the Constitution of Delaware said every person who shall be chosen as a member of either house or appointed to any office or place of trust shall make and subscribe to the following declaration. I do profess faith in God the Father and Jesus Christ his only Son and in the Holy Ghost one God blessed forevermore and I do acknowledge the Holy Scriptures to, uh, to the Old and New Testament to be given by divine inspiration. How far we've come from those days. How far we've drifted. And he says, and he continues, that is not particular to Delaware. Many of the state constitutions said the very same thing. The very same people who crafted these kind of requirements are the people who attended our Constitutional Convention. From George Washington's diary, he writes, Let my heart, gracious God, be so affected with your glory and majesty that I may discharge those weighty duties which thou requirest of me. Again, I have called on thee for pardon and forgiveness of sins, for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ offered on the cross for me. Thou gavest thy son to die for me and has given me assurance of salvation. George Washington's diary. I'm a, I'm a Christian. But I live in a world that's hostile to God. Hostile to the church. Hostile to Christian beliefs. Hostile to the Bible and the principles that we live by. I'm in this world, but I am not of this world. Until Christ returns, True believers can expect hostility from the world because Satan is the God of this world. There's nothing new about it. John 17, 14 to 18, Jesus speaking to his Father, I have given them to you. I, I have no, I have given them, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. For they not, are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. So that is why we are in the midst of a hostile world that hates what we believe in. We're Christians. We are Christians individually because we have accepted Jesus as our personal Savior. It's not a blanket that covers people who don't, who don't agree with it. It's one-on-one. -on -one. His death on the cross paid the penalty for all the sins of mankind, but only those who accept him personally are saved. Born again, believers. In this nation that we love, that is the greatest nation on earth, that we are privileged to be a part of, is it a Christian nation? Can this nation that is so precious to us even be called a godly nation? Not anymore. To me, it sure doesn't look that way. Would a Christian nation have laws allowing the murder of the unborn? Would a Christian nation have laws that sanction behaviors that God calls an abomination? I don't think so. 
we don't have a corner in this in, in this country on evil Satan has been busy trying to destroy everything that is godly from the beginning from the time sin entered the world through Adam it didn't take long for sin to take over during Noah's time it says the whole world was filled with violence there were only eight people that could get on that boat and restart mankind during Abraham's time idolatry reigned God called Abraham out of the culture of idolatry that he lived in in Genesis 12 1 the Lord said to Abram go from your country your people and your father's household to the land that I will show you get out of there get away from there they are ungodly rebellion was almost constant during the exodus after Solomon died a division occurred and the nation was split into two kingdoms the northern kingdom was the ten tribes under Jeroboam son of Nebat became idolaters golden calf worshippers also worshipped the gods of the people around them so God allowed them to be destroyed as a nation and to go into captivity the Assyrian captivity and here's what they were doing 2 Kings 17 14 to 17 but they would not listen and were as stiff-necked as their ancestors who did not trust in the Lord their God they rejected his decrees and the covenant he had made with their ancestors and the statutes he had wanted them to keep they followed worthless idols and themselves became worthless they imitated the nations around them although the Lord had ordered them do not do as they do verse 16 they forsook all the commands of the Lord their God and made for themselves two idols cast in the shape of calves and an Asherah pole they bowed down to all the starry hosts and they worshiped Baal they sacrificed their sons and daughters in the fire they practiced divination and sought omens and sold themselves to do evil in the eyes of the Lord arousing his anger that's what they were doing and that's why he allowed them to be destroyed and sent into captivity in Assyria then Judah started doing the same thing and was taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon people have always flaunted themselves against God rebellion has never gone away after Satan's cast into the lake of fire the world would be like God wanted it to be in the first place there have always been voices in the wilderness warning people to turn to God in repentance God sent the prophets of old to warn the people even in Jesus day God sent a prophet John the Baptist to prepare the way of the Lord the wilderness of Judea where John preached had six cities it was not a total desert without people but John the Baptist had a calling and a purpose from before he was born I don't think I need to, to read uh, all that but he, he was called to prepare the, the way of the Lord the place where he appears first is in the wilderness of Judea in the wilderness Beth Arabah Medin Sekoka Nibshon the city of salt and En Gedai six towns and their villages he came preaching Matthew 3 1 to 3 in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near this is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah a voice of one calling in the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord make straight paths for him his job or his calling 
was to bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord. His calling was to awaken those who heard him a sense of sin and a desire for righteousness. This was the preparing the way of the Lord. He came not fighting nor disputing. He came preaching. He made preaching his consuming passion. He was a priest in the order of Aaron, but we never see him in the temple sacrificing or carrying out the duties of the priesthood. Instead, we see him in the wilderness of, of Judea. He was appointed from before birth to call or to cry out in the wilderness, repent for the kingdom is near. The Bible says he wore a garment of camel hair. It says that he ate locusts and wild honey. Did you ever see a locust? It's a giant grasshopper about that big. So he was a bug eater. He ate locusts and, well, I guess you, I should probably try a couple of grasshoppers sometime. We could get together and have a, have a meal and catch some grasshoppers and fry them up. You wanna do that? Probably not. <laughs> and honey, we could have locusts and honey. We could see what, he, what that was like. But he was separated from the worldly influences and totally given to his mission. Austerity, having a camel hair garment was austere. People wore linen and wool in those days. But that made him seem like a crazy man, a weirdo an oddball or a misfit but people gathered around him because of his message if he had gone out there in the priestly garbs you know they would have just said ho hum we'll just do this or that but because he was strange and different that didn't attract them what attracted them was the message because it was god's word they gathered around him because the religious leaders of the day were corrupt the temple authorities were more absorbed in their appearances, their authority, their rules and regulations, than the core or the essence of worship. They had made their office about their own glory instead of about the coming king. John didn't want to look anything like them. He didn't want to live anything like them. He lived a separated life. He lived and breathed the gospel of repentance that he was preaching. His message, repent. In other words, change your ways. Go a different direction. Go toward God instead of to the world. Everyone needs to repent. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 he preached this doctrine in Judea, not in Jerusalem, but what they call out in the wilderness, out in the country, among the common people. People who would be found in these bleak and less sophisticated surroundings. He preached it among the Jews, a religious people. Religious people need repentance because religion will separate you from God. It will. Some from Jerusalem came out to him, from the big city, some came out to him. We see that the sophisticates, the Pharisees, lowered themselves, leaving the center of their sophistication to come out to John in the wilderness. Maybe it was curiosity to see what this strange man was talking to the people about. But he called him a brood of vipers. And some of them, I can imagine, turned towards God and away from their <coughs> stiff-necked, perpendicular religiosity. So thus the gospel begins in the wilderness instead of in the seat of the religion of the Jews, which is where they were expecting it to come. The wilderness speaks of the coming of the gospel to the Gentiles. The Gentiles are in a wilderness. The Jews 
at least had prophecies about the coming of a Savior. The Gentile world was in a spiritual wilderness. Have you ever been there? Probably. <laughs> That's what you came out of. That's what we all came out of. All of us who know the Lord as Savior were at one time in a wilderness. The wilderness wherein finds us away from God. Can you remember being away from God? That's the wilderness. The people that John went to in the wilderness were unsophisticated common people. But they were, but they were religious. They knew about the law and the prophets. But knowledge doesn't get us close to God. Knowledge doesn't get us close to God. Sacrifice doesn't get us close to God. Only repentance and receiving Christ as Lord and Savior can remove the separation from God. John was preaching change. Repentance without change is no repentance at all. When we're sorry for having offended God, we need to change direction in our life. Can't say, sorry, Lord, I'm doing that, and then do it again five minutes later, Amen. or tomorrow or the next day. So we need to stop going our way and start going God's way. John's response to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Matthew 3, 7, and 8. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. The, the Pharisees and Sadducees were the embodiment or the carriers of religion. That is to say that rules and certain sacrifices can get us to God. But religion actually separates us from God. And how that works is that if you're in a religion, and that religion says that if you do thus and such, then God is obligated to be pleased with you and to bring you into heaven. It doesn't preach repentance. It just pre preaches rules and regulations. That's what religion is. Are we in a wilderness? Spiritually speaking, that is not we personally, but the round, the, what's around us, this world? I think so. We're in a place that's hostile to the gospel. We're in a place that's in opposition to God. You know, it's, it's okay in the world, it's okay to be religious as long as it doesn't affect how you live or how other people live, or as long as it doesn't pull you away from your allegiance to the government. Proverbs 2, 12 to 15, wisdom will save you from the ways of wicked men. For men whose words are perverse, who have left the straight paths to walk in dark ways, who delight in doing wrong and rejoice in the perverseness of evil, whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. So what should we do? We're the candle. We're the spark. We're the few in the world seen. What should we do? Well, what does it say in our opening verse? We're to or be humble, we're to pray, we're to seek, and we're to turn. Repent, be born again. Tell other people about the goodness of God. Operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. Noah is operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. He heard from God. The Spirit enabled him to spend all those years building the ark. Abraham was operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit spoke to him and he said yes and he went. There could be a lot more said about Abraham, but I'll be out of time. Jacob was operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. Moses was operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. The burning bush and the confrontation with Pharaoh and leading what was probably 
a million and a half to three million people, one nation out of another nation. You can't do that without the Holy Spirit. David was operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. From the time that he killed a lion and a bear, from the time that he killed Goliath, to the time when he conquered the nations around Jerusalem. John the Baptist was operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit takes residence in every believer. At the born-again moment, the Spirit comes in. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. And then the baptism of the Holy Spirit that came on the day of Pentecost with the initial evidence of speaking in other tongues empowers people to live the godly life and to share the gospel without fear. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 17, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, it says, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Come out from among them in the King James. Well, you can't extricate yourself physically. That means not, have, not to have a mindset like the worldly people that we dwell in the midst of. Don't let them influence you. Come out from them and be the influencers. The baptism in the Holy Spirit brought power to believers ever since Acts chapter 2. Peter, who had been a pollo grande, that's big chicken in Spanish, ran away. I don't know him. I don't know the man. And in chapter, Acts chapter 2 and 4, when the Holy Spirit came upon them, he went out and preached a sermon. It's recorded in Acts chapter 2. It's, the sermon is recorded. He used scriptures. This was just a fisherman. And 3,000 people got saved that day. The church began. But it has brought power to, to believers ever since then. The church, operating in the power of the Holy Spirit, has been the only way that God has spread the gospel. And the church is the people. It's not the building. It's the church. You are the church. And it's for you to spread the gospel. The power to overcome the world comes through the Holy Spirit. So we're to seek the power. You want to be a flashlight with dead batteries in? You want to be a cell phone with, with no battery in it or no memory left in it? No, it needs to be empowered. And you, as an instrument of God, need to be empowered. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. My people called by my name, we need to humble ourselves, be in prayer, seek the face of God and turn from any sinful ways that are in us. And if we all do that, then he's going to hear us from his place in heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. This land needs a healing. It's in bad shape. And it's just not us, it's the world. It's in bad shape. And I think that's, uh, I think that's knocking on heaven's door. 
I think God's rolling up his sleeves, getting ready to straighten this mess out. Amen. <laughs> but meanwhile, we have families, we have friends, we have relatives, we have co-workers that are going to be in a hard place on that day unless we share the gospel with them. Amen. Amen. Would you stand? Dear Lord, and all through your word, we're challenged, Lord, to share the goodness of our God and not just to keep it to our own self, Lord. We're challenged to do that. We love you, Lord, and we're so blessed to have the gospel. We're so blessed to know that Jesus suffered and died to pay the penalty for our sins, to make it personal, to have the Holy Spirit that brings that, to, that makes that change in us. And we pray that you will empower us, Lord, just to spread that gospel without any fear. We pray, Lord, at this, that this challenge, uh, which I repeatedly do, will fall into hearts that take it very seriously. And um, we are all evangelists. We are all witnesses. We are all soul winners. Not just certain ones who have a thing after their name. But all of us, Lord. And we pray that that challenge will stay on us and with us, Lord. And we ask right now as we go our separate ways that you would dismiss us in your grace. Bring us all back safely next time we meet. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.